Hello, welcome to today's webinar. We're going to be getting started in just another minute. And while folks are getting logged in, I'm going to go ahead and share some housekeeping announcements. Um, you will be muted during today's presentation. If you'd like to ask a question, we ask you to please enter it into the online Q&A. Questions answered via this Q&A feature are going to be taking priority over those entered in the chat. It makes it a little easier for us to manage on our side and know which questions have been already addressed and answered. And we will be saving time at the end of the presentation to address as many questions as possible. This presentation is being recorded and will be made available on the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health in California Labor Lab YouTube page. And all participants who logged in for the webinar today with their full, for the full live presentation with the registration email will receive a link tomorrow to the evaluation form. Once you complete that evaluation, that'll qualify you for a certificate of completion with one continuing education contact hour. And once you've submitted it, you'll be able to access and print your certificate. And at this time, I'm going to hand it over to our moderator for today, Dr. Ed Yellen. Thanks, Michelle, and welcome. I'll start by saying that we postponed this talk by a month be because of the labor dispute on the UCF ZEF campus, the Berkeley campus, and throughout the system. And we're glad that the labor dispute has been resolved. And so here we are um, with our material again from Dr. Harris. So um, this is the last in a series of um, talks about um, the working conditions throughout what we call collar colors, pink, blue, white, no collar. And um, we're really appreciative of um, your feedback on the series, and we hope it served your needs. This is a standard disclaimer that we're part of the Total Worker Health Centers program and what we can't do as a result. Next, no disclosures other than we're thankful for NIOSH's support for our center. Um, the mission of our laboratory is to extend the pursuit in health and safety of, for workers in traditional employment to those in a wide range of alternative arrangements and partnerships with affected communities. We encourage you to come back a week from today when Professor Eileen Boris from University of California, Santa Barbara will talk. She's a professor of feminist studies there endowed professorship um, on the home as a workplace. So very consistent follow up to the talk today from um, Carissa Adams. Next, please. Next month, please come back when um, Dr. Gloria Sorensen from Harvard's Total Worker Health Center is going to um, give the first talk in um, a series devoted to um, how you make work healthy. Um, and they have a very sophisticated, good model of some of the determinants of healthy work, and we welcome her um, next month. So please join us again. So now it's my um, distinct pleasure to um, in, um, introduce Carissa, um, whom I've now worked for for years. Um, there's a cliche that when you want to get something done, you invite a busy person. And um, Carissa is, in fact, a busy person. She's a graduate of our training program at COEH in ergonomics. She now runs the ergonomics program out of the Richmond Field Station. She's the director of the COEH, the Northern California Center for Occupational Environmental Health. She's the director of COEH's ERC, Education Research Center, and she's the associate director of the California Labor Lab for Research. Other than that, she has nothing to do. <laughs> And Thanks without so much, Ed. further ado, um, I introduce Carissa and um, thank her very much for giving this talk when she is so busy on um, home office ergonomics in, um, in the post-COVID era. Carissa? Thanks so much, Ed, for that introduction. And thank you so much for um, including me in the California Labor Lab. It is truly an honor to be a part of it. 
Okay, so uh, today I'm going to talk about home office ergonomics, uh, particularly in the post COVID-19 era. Um, I have no personal financial conflicts of interest to disclose, um, but the UC Human Factors and Ergonomics Lab is supported by uh, these companies. So today I'm going to talk about how the pandemic has really transformed the office environment. We're going to talk about um, ergonomic challenges with the home office, and um, I'll talk a little bit about how the work from home um, disparities were created by the pandemic and, and how we're handling that. Um, and then I'm also going to uh, talk a little bit about the future of office work. So during the pandemic, I think many of us can agree that the office was transformed. Instead of going to a building and going to a place of work, many of us were doing work from home for months on end. And um, that changed how work was done. A lot of us were um, taking care of kids who were uh, at school uh, at home or being schooled at home. We had um, a lot of our home responsibilities really meshing with our work responsibilities. And so all of a sudden there was this real blurred line between the office and the home. Now before 2020, only about 7% of office workers worked from home. And so it was pr pretty easy to uh, control how people were working or at least in what kind of environment they were working in. And many companies actually had um, ergonomic programs and specific equipment that were chosen uh, to facilitate, um, you know, a, a, and accommodate people in their workspaces in the office. This includes adjustable chairs, having a nice desk, many of which actually went up and down, um, and accommodated different positions like standing and sitting. Um, oftentimes at our office, we had multiple monitors. Um, we typically had nice keyboards, nice mouse, and um, a nice quiet environment to do our work in. This is, a, this is how it looked during the pandemic. A lot of people got caught off guard. Um, it was a pretty quick shelter in place um, uh, move from you know being in, in an office to moving to our home office. And over 80% of office workers worked from home during the pandemic. And this meant that a lot of us just went home with simply with a, a laptop. And um, all of a sudden, dining room tables or furniture outside of our homes uh, became our office. And so this had challenges. Um, a lot of people felt negative health effects. And so we're going to talk about some of the physical health effects, the psychosocial stress effects, the impact on productivity, and the impact of working from home on work-life balance. There were some interesting studies that asked people what they ate and how they exercised and um, how they felt during the pandemic, both before as well as after. And there were some interesting findings. A lot of people uh, reported eating more and eating more regularly because the refrigerator was just right there. 70% reported consuming more food in general and 40% consumed more junk food. And so we, we saw an increase in weight for many individuals. Um, people experienced uh, increase in low back pain and 40% um, had some sort of pain since working from home. The psychosocial stress was also um, uh, increased. There was more working hours. A lot of us, you know, woke up, rolled out of bed, um, went to work in our pajamas, and and just kept working throughout the day. Uh, we felt a higher demand due to the pandemic. There was a lot of increase in in workload just due to the nature of of trying to adjust and change uh, from at work. There was also increased stress and anxiety. That was just a really anxious time for a lot of us, not knowing what was happening and um, you know, dealing with a, a pandemic of epic proportions that most of us had, had never experienced. There was um, a lot of stress around job stability. Um, there were times where people felt like their job was not gonna be there anymore and they 
um, were stressed to perform well so that they could keep their job. And then, of course, there was this increased demand for parents who were simultaneously homeschooling their kids while trying to work. From a productivity standpoint, um, it was mixed. Most reported feeling more relaxed, more efficient, and more productive. There was no longer the stress of getting kids to school or commuting to work. Uh, working hours did increase up to 48 minutes per day. A lot of times um, people reported swapping their commute time for work time. Um, the negative piece was that there was no off time. Work became 24 seven. And there was, again, this uh, blurring of the lines between working hours and uh, personal hours. And so report, reports of increased working hours with um, same productivity was, was common. I think one thing that's interesting was to see the differences in perceived productivity, um, certainly by age. One third of workers had trouble staying motivated at home or reported having trouble staying motivated at home. And this was higher among younger workers. Those younger workers really felt more productive in the workplace, possibly because they you know, drew off the experience of more seasoned and older workers. Uh, you can see here in this graph, um, these are um, uh, show among those working from home that younger workers we're more likely to say that they um, face barriers to productivity. Um, people that were younger than 50 had a harder time being motivated to do their work. They um, had a harder time getting their work done without interruptions. They reported having um, a harder time with adequate workspace and meeting deadlines on time. Working without interruptions was tough um, during the pandemic and while working at home. Um, this obviously was impacted by sex as well as by having um, a child at home that was under 18. You can see on the left that um, people uh, who had children at home that were 18 or younger had a harder time um, working without interruptions. As far as work-life balance, four in 10 adults working from home all or most of the time said that they had um, more flexibility to, to choose their hours now than before the COVID, uh, before the pandemic. Um, and that came with some negative aspects. So um, even though there was more flexibility, they also felt less connected to their coworkers. Um, people who were working home from, you know, all the time or most of the time, which is the dark bars, um, also felt that they were working more hours than before the pandemic. 29% um, did feel that it was easier to balance their work family responsibilities. And so that was one of sort of the positive aspects of having the flexibility of working from home. And 19% were more satisfied with their job. And so what we found was that um, flexibility on when they worked um, was actually really appreciated in many regards even though it often led to sort of a blurring of the lines between work and home responsibilities, as well as um, feeling like they were working overall more hours. Um, for workers who did make the switch to teleworking, most had found that um, there was uh, more balance, but less connection with the coworkers. And you can see that 64% um, here said it was easier for them to balance work and personal life and 60% felt that they were less connected. About four in 10 working mothers said it was harder to balance work and family responsibilities. So I thought this was interesting as well because even though um, there was this increased flexibility, it seemed that during the pandemic anyway, when there were kids at home, mothers had a, a difficult time balancing when they were working and when they were helping with family responsibilities. And so this is what the um, home office looked like during the pandemic. Uh, and, and actually, you know, a lot of us still might look like this in our home offices. Uh, you can see in this top right picture, this person is on uh, her phone as well as a laptop while there are kids and her husband are, you know, eating in the kitchen. You can see in this bottom right hand picture, there's a toddler on the dad's lap and um, he's trying to get some work done while the toddler's trying to help. Um, and then in the office on the left, you can see that, you know, this is a beautiful office 
And um, yeah, the, the, there's some very interesting issues with um, how this office is set up and what equipment is provided. So hopefully after this next section, you'll be able to, to pick out some of the um, ergonomic issues with these home offices. So as I mentioned before, uh, when people were in the office, they were able to have you know, some, some good equipment that facilitated good working postures. You can see on the right, we have this nice sitting posture where um, the person is um, in a relatively 90-90 position, their um, forearms are supported, uh, they're looking at a nice monitor that's separated from the keyboard, and um, a lot of us even have a standing uh, adjustable workstation where we can stand as well as sit um, with those same adjustments. What happened when we went to work at home was that we often had makeshift desks at fixed heights. Um, we often sat in stools or hard kitchen chairs, um, ones that didn't have armrests and were not very supportive. Uh, we had these laptops. We had increased demand of work. Um, we had to share our environments often with um, office mates who were doing schoolwork or um, you know, maybe less familiar with working in, in an office with someone else. And um, again, a lot of responsibilities around home and, and uh, work life led to increased stress. There was a nice study that evaluated people's um, equipment from the home office and 70% um, you know, used a laptop. Um, external mice and keyboards were common, but a secondary monitor at home was not. And fixed height work surfaces and makeshift chairs were certainly the biggest problem. So let's talk about some basic ergonomic principles that we were discussing during the pandemic when people you know, were really limited with um, having maybe a laptop, maybe they were able to bring their keyboard and mouse home, but um, other than that, they really didn't have a lot of other equipment. Uh, the first was to optimize the position of the eyes and hands. So keeping the monitor at a separate height from the keyboard allows the arms to be in the right position as well as the neck. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but keeping the hands approximately level with the elbows was um, is really quite important. To minimize disc pressure, you really want a chair that supports this lumbar lordosis. We hope people have found better chairs at home, um, but there's even simple things you can do with towel rolls and such to support that lumbar lordosis. Ideally, you have a backrest as well as an armrest, and I'll go over why that's important in a moment. And then um, finding ways to minimize static loading is really important. Reducing sustained forces on passive support structures like our vertebral vertebra are really important for keeping our backs healthy. And providing a backrest that allows for relaxation and support of the back is also healthy. Uh, and then reducing postural fixity. So allowing this dynamic loading of both vertebrae and muscles and facilitating uh, active and dynamic postures um, is an important aspect of sedentary work. And, and there's tricks that we can um, review to do that um, from the home environment. So let's talk a little bit why we wanna optimize the location of our eyes and hands. Um, we know that there is a, um, a, a problem with using laptops because essentially either the monitor's in the right place and the hands are reaching up above from where they should be, or um, the arms are in the right place and then we are stooping down to um, look and, and view our monitor. So the ideal thing is to have a monitor that's higher than the keyboard and the mouse being used. And that can easily be done with an external keyboard and mouse, and then just raising the laptop on a surface. So essentially, um, you know, if the keyboard height is above the elbow, we know that the neck will um, have some issues. And if the keyboard height is um, below the elbow, then um, we know that the wrist will have some issues. However, if the keyboard is right around the same height as the elbow, then um, that seems to be uh, the lowest risk of pain for both the neck, shoulder, and wrist and forearm. Now, when we talk about minimizing disc pressure, uh, there's a few things to consider. One is the actual posture. And so you can see here standing is um, has the lowest amount of pressure on our discs. Uh, when we slouch and sit without um, any sort of support, whether from our feet, arms, or back, 
that disc pressure is going to increase. And so what we prefer to see is a nice a supportive uh, backrest that even reclines to allow us to sort of um, push back and give our, our, our backs a break and our muscles a break from um, holding our, ourselves up against gravity. We like to see this nice forearm rest to support the upper extremities. And um, you know, prior research has shown that there's actual uh, reduction in um, disc pressure, both when we recline the backrest to uh, past 90 degrees, even to 125 degrees, and when we have armrests. So this is the, the compression when we have armrests, and we can see that just supporting the weight of our arms can reduce the overall compression in our discs. Um, here you can see just another, another study that showed that we have reduced disc uh, pressure when we have um, a recline in the backrest as well as uh, some lumbar support. And minimizing static loading is really important. So from a muscular standpoint, um, we have something called the Cinderella hypothesis, which is where low level static muscle contractions um, from just a few individual motor units seem to be recruited first, and then they stay active, particularly with this low level static muscle contraction. And they're essentially the first ones to come on and they're the last ones to come off. And so they really um, don't get a break. And um, when we vary our postures, we actually will recruit different muscles and we can, we can share the load um, with, you know, with other motor units. Some other examples of static loading include um, when we look forward uh, at a monitor that's too low, or we're looking at our phone, um, you know, our head weighs a good 10 to 12 pounds when we are upright. And as you increase the inclination uh, of your neck um, relative to your trunk and your head relative to your trunk, that same head is going to weigh up to 60 pounds. And so that's just a lot of uh, work for your muscles to maintain this position. And that can lead to a lot of soreness and discomfort. A study by Caraculus and Callahan found that um, changing postures between sitting and standing is actually really helpful for reducing postural fixity and the pain in the back that can come along with it. So in the left here, you see time, 0, 20, 40, 60 minutes. And this is discomfort. And you can see that when someone stands for an hour or sits for an hour consistently, then discomfort increases over that hour. However, when people get up a lot or they move from a sitting to a standing working posture, then um, you know, although the, the pain increases a little bit, it'll drop right back down. And we think that's because in sitting, there's this um, kyphotic, posture, whereas in standing, you have more of an extended lordotic posture. And so moving in between the two of those uh, really helps to prevent the development of pain over time. In a case control study, um, we this uh, looked at the risk of venous thrombosis um, and uh, from sitting. Uh, and, and actually sitting for more than 10 hours a day uh, doing office work with two hour continuous bouts in a 24 hour period led to a 2.8 increase in the risk of a venous thromboembolism. Um, it, the study showed that average and max sitting times were associated with increased risk of VTEs and that there was a 10% increased risk for each hour spent in a day sitting. Um, this is pretty important. Um, we what we you know see from this study is that getting up and down on a regular basis and even working in different postures is really important, um, both in uh, reducing the total time sitting as well as the the total longest duration of time um, sitting without getting up. Okay, so after we went through that, I'm going to ask you guys to consider what's wrong in these pictures. Um, you can put it in the chat if you want, um, or you can wait and I'll go over some of them, but think about this picture up here. What do you see? And what, what, what do you think she's going to experience? What kind of discomfort do you think this person will experience versus this one versus someone who uses 
um, this desk over here. Good. I've seen a lot of really awesome responses in the chat. We see that um, in uh, this particular picture in the upper right hand corner, um, this woman is looking down because her monitor is on the desk. And so you're right, she has neck flexion, she has her phone here. And between looking at both of them, um, this person's likely going to have some neck discomfort. Um, in this picture in the bottom right down here, a lot of distractions. They're cute distractions at that, but they are distractions. And um, just the, the idea of trying to get your work done while your child's trying to help you get your work done um, can be pretty stressful. This person at least has multiple monitors, but the interesting thing is that he has one monitor way over here and the other monitor way over there. And in reality, there should really be one primary monitor directly in front of the user. Um, and then if there is a secondary monitor just to kind of store documents that are not being used immediately, then you know that's fine for that to be off to the side, but certainly this one should be uh, more in the middle. Uh, it's hard to see, but it's expected that the light, the window is probably right in front of the user. And that's also uh, an issue because it can create glare and, and create headaches. In this picture in the bottom left, I absolutely um, agree with some people that uh, chimed in on the chat that these chairs um, have no arm support. The desk is fixed. And so although it might be the right um, height for someone, it's unlikely to be the right height for many people. Um, and um, the other issue is that it's it's static, right? It's not gonna be going up and down at all. And so it'll only support um, sitting. Uh, there could be other issues too, like this sharp edge. Uh, we didn't have time to go over that specific ergonomic risk, but a lot of times these sharp edges can really create issues um, when you're working at a desk like that over time. Okay, so now I want to switch just a little bit to talking about um, some of the gaps that we saw occur during the pandemic um, with this transition to people working from home. And, um, and then uh, I'll also go over some thoughts on, on the hybrid work model. So this is the percentage of households by education and telework status during the, co the, the COVID pandemic. And what we see is that people who had some college or a bachelor's degree or higher um, were essentially had more household members that were able to switch from in-person work to telework. And we see people that had less than a high school degree or a high school or GED degree, they really were not able to change to telework. And this had a lot of um, important consequences. Number one, these people from lower socioeconomic uh, households were more likely to get the, the COVID um, disease based on the fact that they were out at work. Um, and we also saw issues with kids that had to be home um, for school, meaning they were they were schooling from home, and yet they had parents who had to actually physically go into work. And so they were often left either alone or with older siblings, um, or sometimes went to work with their parents and, um, you know, had to uh, attend school using maybe a simple cell phone. We saw that um, Asian Americans and whites were the most common uh, groups of workers who were able to um, work from home. And, um, you know, when, you know, a lot, a lot of this is just based on people with upper income levels having responsibilities um, that could be done from home and those from lower income uh, households just having responsibilities at work that really could not be done from home. Um, but this really did um, tie into how concerned they were about getting exposed to COVID at work. I think what's also interesting is that among those in poor health, four in five reported that no one in their household had switched to telework or changed their telework habits. And that was compared to just over half of those in excellent health. And this is because people who have higher income levels usually have better access to health care and um, are in better health. And so we saw our most vulnerable uh, people having to go into the workplace and getting um, you know, exposed to COVID. We also saw that younger women struggled more. Nearly seven in 10 women under the age of 30 reported a negative mental health impact from the pandemic 
whereas few older adults said the same. So here you see uh, women and men, and these are the percent who say that they felt um, worried or stress related to the COVID-19 had an overall negative impact on their mental health. And you can see that the 18 to 29 age range was actually largest in both men and women, but substantially larger among women. I think what was also interesting was just the number of women who fell out of the workforce. And most of this had to uh, do with um, childcare issues and just not having a place for children to go, for being responsible for their schooling at home. And so a lot of women just left the workforce. Um, the During the pandemic, and this is just about six months ago were these numbers, the ratio of women working had fallen below 57% for the first time since 1988. Um, and I think this is interesting because even though it's it's come back, meaning more women have returned since schools have been you know, in session consistently, an employment gap of just one year can lead to a 39% decrease in annual earnings um, you know, that, that just increases over time. And so what we see is that even though this discrepancy might have been greatest just during the pandemic when kids were uh, at home and being schooled from home, um, this is going to have impacts for years to come. And this really just is contributed to the, the widening gender gap where men are being paid for more than women at every educational level. So regardless of whether they have less than a high school degree or an advanced degree, for the same work, um, men typically get paid more, and that's only going to expand uh, given women's sort of gap during um, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, where you know a lot of them took a break to to be at home with their with their kids. This is called the mom penalty versus the dad premium. I think what's also interesting is that those that were still in the workforce, meaning they were home taking care of kids and they were also working from home, they also fell behind their male peers. Uh, if you take academia, for example, there were fewer publications and um, uh, fewer new projects, meaning new grants, et cetera, that were initiated by women um, versus their male counterparts. Uh, specifically because they were taking on uh, more of the responsibilities of uh, young families at home. Okay, so now that we are still living with the, the with COVID-19, but are no longer in this pandemic stage and now um, in the endemic stage, what now? Well, six in 10 workers say their job can primarily be done from home and they want to do at least some of that work from home. Um, among those, 59% are working from home all or most of the time. These numbers have shifted a bit, but um, and they, they tend to shift based on a lot of different factors. Uh, but the primary take home message is that the future of work continues to be from home. It doesn't mean that people are working from home all of the time, but there is an expectation now that um, if work can be done from home, that there will be some flexibility to be able to do that. These are different sectors, manufacturing, construction, um, other private sector services, and then knowledge intensive services. And you can see that um, really across the board, even from manufacturing to construction to obviously knowledge uh, services, there is an increase in um, the, the you know, number of, of people who felt like, you know, work could be done from home. So before the pandemic, these purple bars represent the percentages of, of people that, you know, envision that work could be done from home. And then um, the blue is during the pandemic and the green is after the pandemic. And you can see that there's really not much of a difference in, in these private sectors and knowledge intensive services as far as um, people believing that work can be done from home. So um, what do we think? What are, um, you know, what, how many people wanna work from home? What percentages are working from home and why? Well, among employed adults whose workplace is currently, um, well, it, it was open during the pandemic. This was in January, 2022. This is the percent saying that each is a major reason why they were working from home most or all the time. 
So some just preferred it. You can see that in, um, in January 2022, 76% just preferred it. 42% um, were still worried about being exposed to uh, COVID-19. 32% cited childcare responsibilities, and 17% actually had relocated during the pandemic away from their workplace and just continued to work um, away uh, from, from the home. So there's pros and cons from working from home. Um, working from home is really valuable, but it's not infallible. The pros are the time flexibility. There's, we saw a huge reduction of air pollution and um, you know when people were not commuting as much, there was certainly a reduction of commute stress and more autonomy. The cons include excessive working hours, increased mental load, um, you know, of, of really, um, you know, having that blurring between um, work and home time, having less mentorship, feeling isolated, having uh, invasion of family space by work and being perceived as working less hard in the workplace. Still, um, remote work overall was considered to be a huge success and it's certainly here to stay. Uh, when asked, 87% of executives think that three days in person is important for company culture. And yet when asked, the majority of employees prefer to work remotely from home three days per week. So what we see right now is that there is a little bit of a difference in what uh, employers would like uh, as far as their, their people working from home versus um, working uh, in the office and what workers would like. And I think there's still a lot of different models that are being trialed. Um, these are some different hybrid work models that are currently being explored. So they vary based on the work environment, whether um, you, know, you, you vary uh, the hybrid model based on scheduling or division of employees. So the first option is remote first and essentially an at-will appearance in the office. And that is, you know, people primarily work from home, but they have a transitional space or flex space that they can go to in the office if they want to meet someone or they just want to get out of their home office. Um, the second is the office first. Um, so this is where people are expected to be in the office, but they have the flexibility to work from home and that flexibility is um, maybe a little bit more generous than it was before the pandemic. So the next type of hybrid work models are based on scheduling. And there's the split week model and the week by week model. The split week model says, okay, this department is going to be in on Monday and Tuesday, and that department's going to be in on Thursday and Friday. And people share spaces. And there's a consistency to when people are expected to be um, in the uh, office versus at their home. The week by week model um, it basically identifies weeks and that can be more effective for say projects or teams that wanna get together for a longer period of time, but then can go off and do their work remotely. And then um, there's certainly um, hybrid models that are just based on division of employees. So there's remote teams and there's onsite teams. This can be problematic because there can appear to be an inequity of, um, you know, certain um, uh, benefits being provided to, say, the remote team um, or, you know, certain benefits being provided to the on-site team. Um, but that this can be uh, another option and is being trialed as well. So overall, how do we transition to optimize health um, both at work and at home? Well, um, there is a saying in ergonomics, your best posture is your next posture. And so um, what we're seeing is this discussion between employers and employees on not only sort of what their schedule can be, but um, who's going to be responsible for purchasing equipment, say, at the home office to provide the same um, adjustability and flexibility in um, working postures that is available um, in, in someone's physical office. And so, um, you know, we hope that whether someone is uh, at home or in an office building, they have sit-stand options. Uh, we hope that they have a chair with supportive um, backrest and armrest and a tilt, specifically a, rec a recline option. And then um, we do hope that they have an external keyboard mouse, an extra monitor, particularly for laptop users. And there's really some very good online training um, and remote ergonomic um, evaluations were actually 
uh, a thing during the pandemic, and I believe they've continued. Um, ergonomic evaluations used to be done in person before the pandemic, largely. And now what we see are some really successful um, you know, online modules that can take people through their own ergonomic evaluations. And um, it can even trigger a sort of one-on-one -on -one ergonomic evaluation, but with someone who is actually uh, remote and zooming in to, to look at the person's workstation. So why do we want people to move? Um, well, there was this one really interesting study that looked at um, two people. So the first, one, the one on the left is the prolonger and the person on the right is the breaker. And so the, the study on the left um, or the person on the left had, you know, had the prolonger had these large bouts of sitting time and then these large bouts of non-sedentary time. Whereas the breaker, um, you can see that the amount of sedentary and non-sedentary time was you know, broken up more throughout the day. And what we saw was that there was a dose response relationship between the number of breaks and things like waist circumference, BMI, triglycerides, and two hour plasma glucose in a fully adjusted model. And so the prolongers had higher waist circumference, higher BMIs, um, you know, uh, worse triglyceride profile uh, versus the breakers. And so we like to see people moving throughout the day. In fact, there was just a, a study that just recently came out that talked about the importance of moving even every 30 minutes. This particular study um, looked at uh, participants that were physically active. And um, what you see here is on the left, you see the amount of physical activity. So this, these people in this row here had more than 300 minutes of physical activity. On the right, you see the duration of sitting hours per day. And so what we see is that although exercise is um, very positive, for um, reducing sort of deaths per 100 person years and, and increasing people's overall general health. Um, we still see that increased sitting time increases risk, even among those who are very physically active. So what this means is that we need to get up more and we need to make it more normal, whether we're working um, in an office or whether we're working from home to get up more and to work in um, different postures, whether it's uh, standing or preferably walking. Um, if you're in person, try some walk and talk meetings, some walking breaks. Um, you can have standing meetings. Um, try to use a trigger, like every time you do your email, maybe try to stand up while reading and responding to emails. Um, and having um, the the organization of the workplace facilitate walking by design, meaning, um, you know, don't put a printer in everyone's office, have one printer that people have to walk to. Uh, when working from home, try the virtual walking meeting. Try just being up front with people and saying, okay, everybody can walk during this meeting. Um, you could have synchronized walking breaks. So for your colleagues who are also working from home, you remind each other at a certain time to go out for a walk. Um, and again, um, having standing uh, options, even if you don't have an adjustable standing desk at home, pulling out an ironing board and putting your uh, laptop on the ironing board so that you can stand up while doing emails can be an effective way to um, change your posture. And there is an app for this. Um, and I believe there's, I'm sure there's more even uh, more, more coming. Um, this particular app just encourages walking um, and provides some different functionality for running meetings while walking um, instead of sitting on a, on a Zoom uh, or video meeting. Okay, so the next thing to consider is reducing psychosocial stress. How are we going to reduce psychosocial stress in this world where we often do have this blurring between um, uh, work and, and the home? The first is to support reasonable work demands. It's okay to expect people to turn off their computer at 5 p.m. when they're working at home. Um, providing flexibility is really important. Um, providing opportunities uh, for autonomy, mentorship, and collaboration despite someone working from home. Um, and then clarifying times where um, there should be intensive quiet work and times where there'd be collaborative work. So sometimes, you know, turning off those message notifications, Slack, et cetera, and, and even blocking out time on your calendar for quiet work can be really effective, um, whether you're at home or in the office. So I'm not sure if you remember some of these. Democracy is part of those scandals. 
Uh, and what will it mean Instances for uh, that happen? a wider region? I think one of your children's just walked in. I mean, shift this, shifting, <laughs> this shifting is the BBC sands in the region. Do you think relations with the North may change? And um, this professor actually became quite famous after his kids nah, um, crashed in on his BBC News interview and his wife went <laughs> flying in there to uh, try to get them um, out of the camera view. And I think what I loved about this video was that it just normalized work-life balance. This is a weather reporter who waiting for that storm to um, was California. giving her news report from home. <laughs> and um, Down below. All right, Santa Clarita, her toddler Santa comes running out and she just picks up the toddler eventually and carries on with her news forecast. We'll talk about this storm. So again, what I what I really liked about these examples and what I think was a, a sort of silver lining of the pandemic was that it really did uh, um, normalize the fact that people had a life outside of work. And um, if we're being asked to um, integrate work into the home, that's going to come with um, you know some interruptions from home. And so this normalization of work life balance and having you know some grace and, and understanding around that, I think, was a really positive aspect. Well, today's to, is to the pandemic, um, but this can be done really explicitly. So having employers explicitly address support and parent um, caregivers uh, is is really important. Um, you know, during the pandemic, people worked longer hours. Uh, there was a lot of parenting needs and parenting struggles. And I think that as we're now out and kids are back in school, um, we should remember that there still are going to be challenges in integrating family and, and uh, you know, this work-life balance. And the more that we support parents um, with young children, uh, the, you know, the, bet, the more effective we're going to be at keeping them in the workplace. So there are opportunities for employers to support uh, childcare challenges. Um, this is like providing work from home options without stigmatization, meaning uh, in the past, it was often looked down upon, frowned upon, that someone would have these um, home or childcare related uh, responsibilities or maybe elderly care responsibilities. And that was sort of assumed that that person wasn't working as hard. So being able to provide this flexibility without sort of stigmatization is, is really important. Allowing for flexibility around childcare responsibilities is really important. And encouraging the sharing of struggles just humanizes that work parenting balance. And I think what we're seeing is that if you're not on board, you're not gonna be able to hire the people that you need. And so there's this interesting you know, shortage of workers. And um, since, Nearly 32% of U.S. employees say they never want to return to the office. Having at least some flexibility and some strategies to get them into the office sometimes is really important. 88% um, say they'd like to continue working from home at least part of the time. 32% said they never want to go back. So how can we design the work both at home uh, and in the office in a way that people maybe do want to come back at least part of the time or, or um, even half the time? And I think what that takes is um, some, some good communication and collaboration. And it's going to be specific to the needs of the company and the needs of you know, whatever the work that's getting done has, as well as the needs of the individual worker, um, whether or not they are taking care of uh, elderly parents or young children, um, and as well as, as the, the environment that the person has. Some people have an environment that they can work from home in quite well. Others you know, really feel like, they concentrate better at work and they need an office, you know, five days a week to get their work done. So I think having that one-on-one -on -one conversation with, with employees and providing that um, flexibility given their life stage and, and individual um, uh, requirements is really important. So to conclude, um, we see that supportive and creative implementation of work from home will be beneficial to both the employee and the employer. Uh, I think that um, we're still working out what kind of um, jobs, what kind of projects uh, require the, the right kind of hybrid model. Um, but there's a, a lot of uh, experimentation that's being done. And I think, um, you know, the, the lines of communication really have to be open between teams and between employees and employers 
to find the right mix that works for both the company as well as the employee. Technology providing hybrid collaboration and communication is key. That can be everything from you know having Zoom uh, options to Slack or something where you you know facilitate messaging regardless of whether someone's in the office or or um, at home. But it can also include uh, some technology that facilitates health and and ergonomics regardless of whether someone's at their home or or um, in the office. Providing equipment and training to support good workstation setup, uh, both at the office and at home, is really critical. This is a tough one. Um, different companies have different, um, you know, expectations around this. Uh, some companies are saying if you choose to work at home, that's your thing and that's your choice, and you are responsible for your um, equipment and workstation. You know, meaning chair, monitor, and everything. Others. Um, you know, provide a stipend and that um, provides uh, support for um, a really excellent workstation setup. And then still other companies seem to be going halfway in between, meaning they might get uh, a monitor or keyboard or mouse, but they're not going to go as far as, as providing a chair and or a desk. I, I'm not sure what the right answer is, but I will say that as we have more of these hybrid models where people are working at home and uh, in the office, um, it's going to be difficult to um, separate where someone is getting hurt. And so the best answer is to make sure that they have the equipment and training they need regardless of where they're working. Um, and uh, each company will have to really come up with a policy that is, is feasible for them. Uh, encouraging team movement and activity in both the office and home is really critical. And this can be done, you know, in conjunction with one another, meaning you have some people in the office, you have some people at home. There's no reason why they they can't both um, take walks at the same time or, or have a walk and talk meeting using some of the new technology that's out there. And then um, really encouraging stop times and office hours uh, to reduce burnout is key. Um, we have to remember that people have responsibilities and people need to shut their computers off and they need to turn their phones off um, to get a break and to be able to focus 100% on their families or other responsibilities outside of work. And so, um, you know, try to set up some parameters and some guidelines as to when uh, meetings can be requested and when they can't be. There are some companies that are going to a four-day work week with actually some pretty good success. There's other companies who um, are just at least saying, okay, Fridays, we're not going to have any scheduled meetings. And so that's people's sort of quiet time to get work done. So I think um, as we move forward, we'll be seeing uh, more and more research on how some of these different strategies are having an impact on people. And with that, uh, maybe I'll go to some questions. And I thank you for all of your, all of your attention. Um, I, I just, you know, want to finish by, by saying that, um, I, I do think that if work from home is implemented properly, there's some really great outcomes, uh, not just work-life balance, um, but the normalization of, of, um, providing parents and, and, you know, caretakers that, that need for flexibility, um, and normalizing that. Um, I think there's also some great opportunities to retain women in the workforce. And of course, it's going to help recruit top talent and ease up those terrible commutes. Chris, um, this, Chris yeah. is fantastic. And there are a ton of questions, great questions in the Q&A. So uh, um, okay, we have about on. five minutes. Um, there are more than five. And I am going to give them in rapid fire and maybe um, okay. Sounds good. seconds east. And I should just say in opening, that my watch just gave me an alert to stand that I've been sitting. To. <laughs> I was trans. Um, so any thoughts of using chair armrests for arm support versus supporting the arms by resting them on the desk in front of the keyboard? Another question is the take on use of armrests during computer work. Yeah, um, we, you know, 20 years ago, free floating arms were the thing. And that is wrong for the reasons I mentioned. Um, our arms weigh a fair amount. And so supporting them is important. Um, I, you know, it really depends. I, I'm not um, opposed to having your arms rested on the on the desk and, you know, pushing that, that keyboard tray forward. 
You do have to be careful because you're in sort of a sustained flexed position at the shoulder. So you just have to monitor that for shoulder discomfort. But um, I personally think that mixing it up is really helpful. Um, you know, using your desk for forearm support, using your armrest for forearm support, uh, and mixing it up is typically the best. So um, are there any studies that look at cervical disc changes due to increased forward head posture when back seat is reclined to reduce lumbar disc press pressure? Um, let's see. Disc changes due to increased forward head posture. Oh, yeah. So th that's a great point. Um, typically, if the backrest is reclined to reduce lumbar disc pressure and someone is trying to do task work on the computer, they will have that forward flex position and there will be increased cervical disc compression. So really you want to recline when you're on the phone, when you're, you know, in a zoom, not doing really precise task work, like typing on a computer. What are some of the metrics you look for in a successful remote ergonomics program? That's a great question. I would look at monitoring, um, you know, really doing surveillance. So, um, I would look at things like pain and reports of pain. Um, you know, it, particularly with office ergonomics, the location of the pain often tells you what's wrong with the workstation. Um, and so I think that would be one metric. Another would be how, how is my training education program? Um, are people able to sort of problem solve what's wrong and, and fix what they can? Um, and then I would say, um, you know, one other metric might uh, be sort of people's um, self-reported uh, productivity. So was there discussion with management to see why three days would be as effective for the work environment? <laughs> no, not in that study that I, uh, that I, that I um, put that graph up on. It was just, they, they were just asking sort of what the ideal number of days would be. Um, you know, it's, it's really tricky and I don't think it's a one size fits all. And that's why I think we're going to kind of grow leaps and bounds in the next couple of years, figuring out during what time for what team is most, which hybrid model is most effective. Yeah. Um, you know, for design teams, for example, it's probably more effective to do week by week. Um, and so I think that it's maybe a, you know, answering that with a, with a, with a broad stroke brush, um, saying that the three days, that was their impression. So are there statistics on the amount of savings from working at home? And obviously that's commute and greater productivity because people are giving more time, as you pointed out. And a related question, are there worker comp stats on work from home musculoskeletal conditions versus work from the office? I do not have numbers on that, but I would imagine that some of those, um, you know, should be coming out at, at, as we have a more permanent um, transition to the home office. So um, a question with all the work done in the area of the home ergonomics, two areas of concern is the liability for companies as they have not provided a healthy workplace whether that is not giving anything but a laptop or having too many back-to-back -back Zoom meetings with not enough breaks. How can we get employers to get better work practices to address these issues? Um, I, uh, you know, I've been shocked that this hasn't come up sooner, um, meaning um, I would have thought there would have been some liability or lawsuit at this point with where a company, you know, was not providing equipment at a home office and someone, you know, was injured. I have not, I've been asking, I haven't heard of any numbers or statistics around that at this point. Um, but I do think that Kermit's right. I mean, we, we really do need to come up with some, some good rules of thumb or best practices for employers to support um, a more healthy work from home environment. And frankly, just, be, you know, the, the, the back to back zoom meetings is really tough and that can be solved by saying, you know what, everyone needs to have 45 minute meetings. And so there's always 15 minutes uh, of each hour where someone can stand up, you know, have a bio break, have a mind break, et cetera. So I think it does take a cultural shift and that's something that has to be discussed and explored within a company um, so that there's, you know, buy-in from all the different stakeholders um, but I do think it's there's some work organizational best practices that can help with that. 
So one more quick question. How often should we change the sitting and standing position or how long should we stay in each one? Uh, that, that's a great question. Um, I believe um, our, our friends from Ohio State uh, just published a study and I, that was what I was alluding to. Um, Gary uh, found that, I, I believe he found that every 30 minutes is the right amount of time to um, you know to stand up and move. So even even every sixty minutes, uh, I, I think, is too long to stay seated. It's tough mm -hmm. to remember to move that much. And before we move to thanking you for a fantastic presentation, there's an observation from um, one of the people watching this that um, she's noticing that workers just out of college want more time in the office, not less. And perhaps that's due to the fact that they spent most of college being isolated from others. So- Yeah, I, I agree. And also that mentorship piece is, is key. So um, yeah, that's something to, to be aware of for our, our younger colleagues. Right, and for those of us with a little gray hair, it's something we should, um, notice for the younger workers who need mentorship. Um, Chris, this was a fantastic presentation. The participation was really amazing in the audience. I think close to 100 total chats and 15 or 16 questions and over 200 people joined the webinar. So thank you very much. So Great, well, thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone for joining. And we will see you next week for a talk from a feminist historian, Eileen Boris. Thank you. Goodbye.